Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Mover Mailbag. I know it's been a while. Last week I was out uh, flying, and then, man, it's been a week this week. So for everyone that has asked, uh, we were very fortunate with Hurricane Ida. Uh, minimal damage, just the fence, and we were out without power for about three days. I know I made that post on the community post because they were saying it was going to be a week or more, but luckily Wednesday evening we got power back. So a huge thank you to the linemen that came from all over the country. Uh, to help with the devastation that a lot of people have experienced. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things, you get these big storms and you could have a tree down in the neighbor's yard, a tree down in the neighbor's house, and your house is perfectly fine or vice versa. You know, it's just, uh, it, it's really a lottery, if you will, as to whether or not you're going to have uh, significant damage or, or not. So one thing I did learn, though, I need a whole home generator ASAP. That's one of those things that... Uh, I thought I could do without. I got spoiled. Last year we had Hurricane Zeta and the power was back on the next day and it was on the heels of a cold front. So, you know, it wasn't even that bad without the air conditioner. But we've had uh, the heat index has been over 103 every day this week and it's just been miserable. So uh, thoughts are with everybody. That's the thing that no one really talks about is the aftermath of just how hot it is. And I think we're going to have a lot of heat injuries and heat strokes because I was out with the sheriff's office a couple nights ago, and that was the majority of the medical calls. And you know, the fire department was out constantly uh, responding to heat stroke or, or heat injury, heat illness, stuff like that. So a uh, special thank you to everybody, all the first responders and, like I said, the linemen that have come down uh, to try to rebuild the community. So uh, and thoughts for those that uh, lost everything. Uh, we're going to go back to the mailbag, uh, answer some of your questions, and I've got a couple of uh, pieces of mail, so we'll check that out and talk about it. Uh, so programming note before we start, two things. One, uh, I, I videoed a little bit of the hurricane from where I was, um, so if you want to check that out, go to the other channel, Life with Mover. Question for the comments below. Uh, I'm actually thinking about stopping Life with Mover and just putting everything on this channel because originally this channel was just me. It's an author channel. It was supposed to be, you know, stuff that I was interested in, cars, books, airplanes, all that stuff. And we kind of shifted focus and just did airplanes and aircraft for a while. And we're going to put everything on the Life with Mover channel. But I haven't updated that in three months. It's not monetized. It's kind of, you know, the juice isn't really worth the squeeze. So I'm thinking about bringing everything back to just this one channel. So let me know what you think in the comments uh, below. But in the meantime, if you want to check out that video, uh, it's on the other uh, channel. So, um, yeah. All right, let's take a look at what you've sent. All right, this first one comes from D. Doesn't really have a name. I didn't bring my knife. Oh, I do have my knife. I have a knife. And this is veteran-owned, veteran-operated, USA-made. Thank you for supporting veteran-owned, made in the USA brand. Every purchase allows Bottle Breacher to accomplish our mission, providing jobs for Americans, supporting our local and national economy, giving back to the veteran advocacy, and keeping manufacturing in the United States. BottleBreacher.com. Oh, cool. It's a Bottle Breacher. Nice! So, it says Air Force, which I think is cool, but on the other side, it says Mover. I think that's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, there's no note. So, um, but Elijah Crane is the founder and CEO of BottleBreacher.com. 7.62, 30mm or 50 cal is what you can get. Oh, that's cool. Thank you. You can get a hand grenade too. Okay. Uh, I've been messing with the formatting here, so if it looks wrong, sorry. Uh, let's get to your emails. This comes from Caleb. Love the channel. Thank you for your service. I meet all of the requirements as a civilian to apply for a spot in the guard, and I'm trying to choose what units to go to after. I really want something in Warner Robins, Georgia, since there's, that's where I'm from. However, they fly the E-8C. Problem with that is I've heard the J-STARS program is ending, so that aircraft might no longer be in use. Should I still put an effort to rush the squadron and try to apply? What exactly could happen in that situation? Would the squadron get moved or get trained for another airframe? Could the squadron just all out close? Thanks, Caleb. 
Is it an is it guard or Air Force Reserve? So typically when a unit transitions, um, you just transition to whatever the unit does. Unless they just completely close and stop flying, um, then you would have to go find another unit and they would help place you. I'm actually currently in that situation, believe it or not, because my T-38A job, uh, which is Air Force Reserve, is defunded as of October. So they're giving us till February 6th to find another job. And they are not helping us at all. I mean, there is no, hey, you'll transition, because the actual unit is transitioning the F-35, but for T-38 guys, there's no such support. So uh, I hate to be a little cynical, but having seen this firsthand, I would not rely on leadership at any level to protect you or to find you a job. So I would recommend not going to a dying airframe uh, or a closing airframe. I would recommend going and finding something else because uh, they have no obligation to find anything for you. I mean, in my case, they've basically told us that uh, even though the unit's transitioning to the F-35, not their problem, the, the timeline between when we're defunded, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because the mission's still gonna stay, and F-35 showing up is so great that they don't want to continue supporting us, so they're gonna kick us to the inactive ready reserve if we don't have a job by then. So. I would not expect anyone to take care of you in that case. Uh, so I, I would not put myself in that position knowing that. I would try to go to an airframe that has some longevity uh, and you know is local. I think maybe Dobbins might have something for the guard, so it's right down the road, uh, and maybe Moody uh, flying A-10s. But uh, I wish I had a better answer, but uh, I just haven't been impressed with what I've seen as far as how... Um, some of the leadership will take care of you because they just won't. I mean, that's that's not their responsibility and they don't believe it. They don't believe it to be their responsibility. So at the end of the day, you know, you are responsible for yourself. And I just wouldn't recommend putting yourself in a situation where you could get kicked to the street uh, because you can't find anything. Because right now the military pilot job market sucks because everybody's staying in the, in the reserves and the guard because of the airlines not hiring. Uh, you know, with the uncertainty of the economy and stuff like that, people just aren't, aren't going out there. So anyway, sorry, Caleb. I would recommend finding something else. Uh, Marcus says, stay safe movers. I noticed you're in the path of, for Ida, Method Man. Yep, we sure were. Um, we had 100 plus mile an hour winds for about, I think it was between four and six hours. So it sucked, but uh, we were very fortunate. I'm very grateful that, you know, we got power back and, you know, a lot of people don't have power right now. All right, this is from uh, Rory. I'm an active duty Marine Corps officer in the Air Command and Control community. I'm faced with a decision to either stay in the Corps by accepting career designation or to exit this coming spring. While I'm not completely ready to leave the Marines, my career aspiration is to fly. The Marine Corps has a field accession program where they'll pick a few officers a year, become student naval aviators, usually out of hundreds of applicants. And this is the reason that I've been looking into the Air Force, Air Force Reserve, and Air National Guard. Problem is I'm hesitant to get out of the Marine Corps if there is a chance that I may not get picked up for another aviation program. Obviously with no risk, there's no reward. I'm wondering if you know anything about receiving a conditional release from my current service if I were to select it for an aviation program. I understand you have experience from moving one service to another and I appreciate any information you can provide. Okay, a couple things. One, uh, to do the inter-service transfer, you have to have a position to go to. So you will already know that you're going to a rated spot because you've gotten hired by an Air Force Reserve squadron or an Air National Guard squadron, or you did a rated board for the Air Force. So uh, you have to have a place to go. That's step one. So there, there is really no chance that you wouldn't get picked up because the only way to do it is if you got picked up. Second, um, be careful with this because the time it takes, it takes a long time because you have to do what's called a scroll. Being a first lieutenant, it's not as bad because you only, I think it only takes about six months for scrolling because you only have to go to the secretary level of your service versus um, for O fours and above, it's actually it's congressional scroll. So, you know, Congress, they do it when they do it. So it takes a while. So um, 
you can do that. It is possible. I would recommend trying to do the uh, student naval aviator thing if you can and applying to guard units wherever you can. I mean, take your experience and go, you know, because it's just a long process. You're going to have to get medically cleared uh, by the Air Force uh, to do that. And because you're a new trainee, you're going to UPT. Uh, it's a more streamlined process, but it will take a while. But the biggest, the long pole in the tent is to get scrolled. I mean, that's the biggest thing, and that's going to take a while. So uh, I would talk to an uh, Air Force Reserve or Air National Guard officer accessions recruiter uh, and find out, you know, how you get that process started once you meet a board. But the biggest thing first is meet a board, get hired by a unit. And that's, that's really all you can do. Make them tell you no. I like it. Do that. Hey, Mover, I currently want to join the Australian Air Force, and your channel's motivated me greatly for that and everything else you do. I have two questions. Asthma. I have asthma. I want to know if that's a barrier. I know about make them tell you no, and we'll try my hardest, whatever you say, but I want to know how much of a barrier is asthma to flying. Very big barrier. In the U.S., I don't know about Australia, but in the U.S., uh, it is a showstopper if it's happened after a certain age. I don't remember what it is. It might be 10 or 12. Um but childhood asthma usually you can get a waiver for anything after that is a deal breaker you just can't it's not going to happen so uh, i still recommend replying and make them tell you no but if you still have asthma today going to be a problem fighter pilot mask what is the purpose of masks in the cockpit do you need them because the cockpit isn't pressurized at high altitude or is it something for high g forces thanks for the motivation it's actually both so um, the cockpit in a fighter is pressurized to 8,000 feet. Remember, you're a single pilot. So if you have a rapid decompression or something like that above a certain altitude, you only have very few seconds of time of useful consciousness. Uh, actually, airliners, if you go, uh, what is it, 41, 43,000 feet, something like that, one guy has to be on oxygen because of the time of useful consciousness is only like you know 20 or 30 seconds. So that's part one. You go above 24,000 feet, it's a, it's a pressure delta. So, you know, it could be above 10,000 feet cockpit altitude. But uh, the other piece to that, too, plus if you eject, you know, now you've got your oxygen mask hooked up to your, you've got a little oxygen bottle in the seat. So that's the other part of that. Uh, in modern fighters with um, Combat Edge, you see an extra little hose uh, there that's called PBG, pressure breathing under G. So it actually inflates the mask and the helmet and it pushes it against your face to give you more pressure breathing when you're pulling G's, uh, which you know, oxygenates your, uh, your blood cells, gives you a little bit better G tolerance, stuff like that. So it's a little bit of both. I mean, you, it is required uh, not all the time. You know, if you're just flying around and you know, you're just you know, cockpit altitudes 8,000 feet or below, you can drop your mask, it's not a big deal. But in general, uh, it's for you know, high altitude stuff. If the cabin were to depressurize, pulling G's, it helps. You know, it gives you a little bit more oxygen. And um, also, that's where your mic is, you know, your mask. Because if you could drop your mask, it makes a real loud noise. It's kind of annoying. Anyway, thanks for the question, Timothy. Good luck. Uh, I think you got an uphill battle, though. Hi, Mr. Lemoyne. I'm 14 years old, starting high school. I've had an interest in military aviation for years now. Developed an interest in finding ways I can help my community and serve my country. I discovered your channel a year ago and have since become a big fan. Thanks for your content. Now, I have some questions I wanted to address to you. I have a dream of becoming a fighter pilot in the future, a way to combine my military aviation interest and wish to serve my nation. Alternatively, I've thought of becoming an aerospace engineer. My questions to you are, what do you think the USAF of my generation of 2030s pilots, I say my generation because I'm still young and beginning my path to this goal by succeeding in school, will look like? Will it be an all stealth force complemented by a squadron of UAVs? Uh, to answer your first question, no, not in the 2030s. Um, you know, they're, the EX is coming online. They're extending the life of the F-16, possibly buying more F-16s. Uh, A-10 will be around for God knows how long. B-52 will be around. You'll have more, but, you know, in the 2030s is actually probably when the F-22 is going to start to retire. So it'll mostly be F-35. Um, but there could be, like, loyal wingmen and stuff like that. Um, but I don't think 2030s is going to look drastically different than what you see now. Do you think the F-22 will be in service or, or a 6th Gen will have replaced it? Well, the plan is for a 6th Gen to have replaced it, but we know how contracting works. I mean, you never know. It's hard to say. Uh, do you think the F-35 will replace the A-10 and F-16 or will have another fighter like the F-36 King Snake to assist in this process? F-36 King Snake's not a real thing, so no. 
Uh, F-35 will be around. A-10 will probably still be around. Viper, in small numbers, might still be around. Uh, mostly in the guard, I think is what you'll see. The EX, you'll see a lot of F-35s, F-15 EXs, or F Eagle Twos. Um, maybe if they buy new Vipers, who knows? You know, the Block 70s or something. Anyway, interesting questions, but, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, man. I mean, the defense acquisitions process is really hard to predict. Mover, uh, big fan of your channel and message. I have a question that I've not heard you address before. I'd love to hear your answer on your channel. While I'm not in a position in life to become a fighter pilot anymore, I hope this question can help someone else or at least provide some insight. Uh, when I was 18, I made some bad choices, convicted of felony for marijuana distribution. Fast forward 15 years since then, I've graduated a bachelor's degree in science from a respected university. I've found great success in my career and have a wonderful wife and family. While I've never seen your content before recently, I truly embodied, embodied the make them tell you no mindset on my path to successfully regaining respectful, respected place in our society. Being marked as a felon closes more doors than you can imagine, making everything from finding an apartment, a job, or even a credit card more difficult. Truly blessed to have recovered from my situation. Owe a lot of gratitude to my support system consisting of my family and friends. My experience has made me passionate about helping others who made mistakes reform their lives. I mean, firsthand example of what can happen, give them the second chance. I'd like to tell my story, not only give hope to those who messed up, but also remind others that mistakes one can make, help them grow and become a better person who's worthy of opportunity and trust. Is it possible for a person with a felony on their record to become a fighter pilot? Your fan, Andrew. No. It, so, not if it's on the record, no. Um, I mean, felons can't be law enforcement, felons can't uh, have firearms, felons cannot be officers, you know. Um, you actually can't even have an ATP, so you couldn't even be an airline pilot because you have to be a good moral standing. The felony is going to put that to bed. Uh, if you get it expunged, you got a shot if you can explain it. Um, but a standing felony on your record is going to be a showstopper because you're not going to be able to get a security clearance. You're not going to be able to become an officer. Um, yeah, you're not going to be able to do a lot of things. So unfortunately, unless you can, I mean, I, I appreciate the reform and I think that's awesome. But unfortunately, the way our society and the way things are set up, I don't think it's a recoverable thing with regard to military law enforcement, airline, that kind of thing. So um, might, and maybe I'm wrong. If you know, if in the comments you know of a scenario or if you know of a way to do it, please, uh, I'll pin your comment. Please let us know. But uh, from what I know, you know, having made, made these applications, felony is always asked. And from what I understand, it's always a showstopper. So, um, but it's a good question. And I applaud the fact that you've overcome you know these things and, and learn from your mistakes all right that'll do it for today's mover mailbag i hope you guys are having a great week again my thoughts are with those affected by hurricane ida uh, i'll be back out uh, next week so you'll get a couple videos uh oh6 uh i got to actually got to fly it as pic which is cool and i'm gonna try to get i don't know no promises but a mover ruins movies on an airwolf episode so that's my two my goal for next week so hope you guys enjoyed it thanks for watching see you next time Thank you.